birthday weekend, America. How many of you are just so grateful you are living in America today? Amen, somebody. Amen. Did you know that thousands or millions of people want to move here? A land of opportunity. This is my adopted nation, and we pray and we believe the best days are still ahead of us. Amen? Amen. I want you to stand up on your feet, and I want you to recite our inspirational verse as we navigate this crazy season. And this is coming from Jesus Christ. He made a promise that before we experience this pandemic, or any debacles in our life, God has a promise. Everybody read this together with me. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome. God is not denying the problem or the trouble. But God says, I have overcome the world. Amen? So everybody at the count of three, I want you to shout Praise the Lord. One, two, three. Praise the Lord. Come on, one more time. One, two, three. Praise the Lord. Amen. You can now be seated. You know, I'm excited uh, to preach this message. This is like a fresh from the oven of the Holy Spirit that God has downloaded in my heart. And I just want to, I can't wait to preach today. Amen. Amen. For those of you who are watching online, I want you to uh, say this with me. Uh, everybody say, victims. Hello, victims, victors, vessels. Say it again. Victims, victors. So here's the, how I process life. All of us probably, this is how you look at life. Sometimes you look at life from a point of view of a victim. How many of you have been victimized before? People who promise to deliver back out on you. For we are all victimized by this COVID-19. The world shut down. Loss of a job. Or maybe something bad happened to you. You've been a victim. Fraud, identity theft. But how many of you experience that in the midst of being a victim, God conquers it and you become a victor? Come on, somebody. Amen? And then, you know why God allowed you to conquer that habit, to conquer that addiction, to conquer that poverty, to conquer that misfortune in life, to conquer that abuse? Because He wants you to become a vessel. Amen, somebody? There's a lot of people right now, be, uh, their lives are being allowed by, they're letting the devil use them as a vessel of division, a vessel of hatred, a vessel of destruction. We Christians should be the vessel of love. Amen, somebody. A vessel of hope. Amen, church. So here's the big idea. I live in this principle because I experienced this. The choice is yours. Everybody say the choice is yours. You always have a choice. Some people play victims and their life never changes. But some people become victors and become life changers. Amen? Amen? So the choice is yours. I ask you right now, choose the, the victor part. Amen? Amen? Our life could change for the good. Amen? So basically, uh, when you are a victim, this is your question. What happened to me or what is happening to me? I'll just be honest, church. Uh, if somebody stole your shoes, L.A. Gears, they don't make that anymore. <laughs> this 1989. Let it go. <laughs> if somebody stole your FUBU jacket, remember the FUBU jacket? And you're still mad about that? Come on. It's time to let it go. Because... When you play that victim rule, it's always what happened to me. This is what they did to me. You know what pa that pastor did to me? You know what that banker did to me? 
You know what that job did to me? You know what my wife did to me? My husband did to me? You always focus on yourself. Then I want you to focus on how to become a victor. Everybody say, what is happening for me? How many of you believe God is for you? We sang that I've got for you, favor for you. God wants you to be a victory, amen? Have a victor, amen? So everybody say now, vessel. What is happening through me? So now God wants you to have a victory, and he wants you to be a vessel to help other people. Now here's a story that we could probably relate to this. This is one of the darkest moments in history of Israel. As we all know, Israel is the apple of God's eye. God chose this tiny nation to represent God to the world. That's the only reason why God chose Israel, not because they're special, but God wants them to make God special in their lives so that people will see, and then they will choose to call on the God of Israel. So God's blessed them. They became a nation, powerful. During the time of King David, no foreign Enemies could conquer Israel. During the time of the sun, Solomon, riches all over, prosperity all over. Nations are going to Israel to seek an audience with the wise men, all Solomon. But you know, sometimes when you become popular, you become powerful, become famous, pride gets in the way. They stop calling on God and they started embracing idolatry. The saddest part of Israel is it was divided, north and south. Ten tribes became so evil, they went with Jeroboam, and then the remaining faithful, Judah and Benjamin, southern kingdom, went with Rehoboam. Jeroboam, Rehoboam. It's like a confusing name, but Jeroboam, Rehoboam. During the dark moments, God sent a messenger. I believe with all my heart, in these dark times that we are living right now, God wants us to be a messenger of hope. Come on, somebody, amen? God wants you to be his voice. So he used two prophets. Everybody say, Elijah, Elisha. Could you just raise your hands if sometimes you get confused of these two Prophets, amen. Raise your hands if you get confused. Or maybe you don't know who these guys are, right? Elijah is the one who called fire from heaven. Elijah is the one who battled the prophets of Baal. He's a mighty man of God. Elijah did not die. God took him, riding on a world uh, chariot of fire, going up to heaven. What a way to go. And then his, man, his disciple is Elisha. Everybody say Elisha. You know how I would not forget these two guys? Everybody say, Ja. Everybody say, Sha. I always think about this, James and Sharon. So, ja, Sha. You know, it's hard for us because we speak English. But you know, in Israel, they speak Hebrew. You know how they pronounce Elijah in, in Hebrew? Eliyahu. Everybody say, Eliyahu. You know how they pronounce Elisha in Hebrew? Elisha. So they're not confused. Oh, yeah, that's prophet Eliyahu. Oh, that's prophet Elisha. So, but for us, we speak English. It's Elijah and Elisha. I want to take this opportunity to introduce to you a young prophet. His name is Elisha. He experienced ridiculous provision. Can I just ask you right now, with a show of your hand, and those of you watching us online, how many of you... Need a miracle in your finances? Wave your hand. Come on. Type it in. Come on. How many of you need a ridiculous provision right now? Come on, somebody. That you know that you know that you will not survive un unless God provides. Come on, somebody. This is how Elisha came to the scene when the nation is divided, there are no more walls. They have no more temple. People are fighting. It seems like evil is winning. And here comes a sorry, sad story of a woman. The Bible did not mention her name. But the Bible said she's a wife of a prophet. 
So we could say that she is the preacher's wife. So here's the story. Let's all read it together. I want you to read together, church. Get, I want you to, in this time of pandemic, you spend more time with the Word of God. Can I just say this right now? You cannot go to the next season by Netflix. You need the Word of God. Come on, somebody. Everybody read this together. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. Let's read this, charisma. And you know, he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Your servant has nothing there at all. She said, except a small jar of olive oil. Continue. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me what do you have in your house. Let's continue reading this. And Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask just for a few. Then go inside. Everybody say, shut the door. Behind you and your sons, pour oil into all jars, and each is filled, put it on one side. Continue reading. She left him and shut the door behind her sons. Continue reading this. They brought the jars to her and kept, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. Continue reading. But he replied, there's not a jar left. The oil stopped flowing. So let me tell you the background. I tell you three Ds. This lady experienced as a victim. She became a victor and she became a vessel. Let's start first with the easy part. How was she victimized? Imagine this. Let's read the story. A widow. One of the Lord's prophets said to Elisha, You know, before my husband died, he was a follower of yours and a worshiper of the Lord. But he owed some money. Now this man is on his way to take my two sons as his slave. Just reading this first verse, it's crisis. This is red alert. This is, whoa, emergency, need help. Now we need to ex explain to you the background so you fully understand. Back in the day, there's no bankruptcy. There's no welfare system. There is no stimulus program from the government. And when you owe creditor, you cannot pay, they will get your children to work for them for at least six years. And on the seventh year, they will be released. That's the year of Jubilee. Imagine this. She's a victim of a circumstances beyond her control. The husband died. And she's a victim. Her husband owes a lot of money. She's a victim beyond her circumstances. Maybe this is how you look at this going on in your life. You feel like a victim of COVID-19. Somebody died, got sick. They closed your business. They closed your account. They closed your opportunity to travel. They closed this. They closed that. They feel like they're being victimized by the season of life. Now, before we judge the husband, because she had a lot of debts, I want you to propose to you a tradition. This is a tradition. When I say tradition, the Bible did not mention the, what, the name, but it's part of the Jewish uh, tradition that they believe who the husband was. This guy is a good guy. Follower, a prophet, and a worshiper. How many of you now believe that being a follower and a worshiper of God does not exempt you from problems? Come on, somebody. Troubles happen to everyone. There's no distinction. 
Now, this guy, they said, is Prophet Obadiah. Obadiah is one of the disciples of Elisha. Now, you know, this guy is a good guy. In 1 Kings chapter 18, watch this, just read this together with me. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab, evil, made a decree, kill all the prophets. It's like saying, kill all the pastors. Don't just shut down the church. Kill all the pastors. That's what they were trying to do. Kill all the, the prophets. And the prophets went in hiding. Obadiah took 100 prophets. The Bible says, verse 4. And hidden them in two caves, 50 in each, and supplied them with food and water. No wonder he got in debt. Was borrowing money to feed the pastors, to feed these prophets, to take care of God's people. So now, to give you a perspective, it's like this lady is running on empty. Her, her, her gas level or energy level is down to E. There's debt. Look at the screen. There's debt, and she's destitute. What do you do when your money is funny and your credit don't get it? She's nameless, penniless, helpless, but not hopeless. Come on, somebody. You might be helpless, feeling weak right now, but let me propose to you, you're not hopeless in Jesus' name. Amen. So now... I want you to see here, she came to the prophet. It's like as if he's saying, hey, you know what my husband did for your pastors, for your staff? I took care of them. I fed them. This is what the Bible says. So I want you to help me now. Let's read together. Here's what Elijah asked. Everybody, one, two, three. What can I do to help you? Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in your house? house. The lady responded, everybody read it together, nothing at all except a jar of olive oil, she replied. She's a victim. Debt, destitute, debts. She came to the man of God. The good thing going on with this lady, she could run away. She could escape Israel and go to Egypt or go to Syria because she has no more future in Israel. Kids will be put to child labor. The good thing about her, she went to the right direction. She went to the man of God. Because knowing that the man of God represents God. Come on, somebody. When you are going through the crisis of life, church, I challenge you. Go to your spiritual leader. Amen. Go to your pastor. Go to, to the one you oversee over you and tell them about your problem. Go to me. Go to Pastor Arby, go to Pastor Arl, but don't ask for money. We'll pray for you. <laughs> so, I want you to see here, the reason why Elisha asking her a question, what do you have? Because Elisha doesn't want this lady to have a victim mentality or self-pity. You know, you see these people who are victimized, when they're been victimized, Oh, feel sorry for myself. You have to take care of me. You have to feed me. You have to help me. We're, we're, we're that church. But sometimes they become so abusive. That's why if you are always working with people and, and always asking for a handout, there comes a time, church, let me just tell you this, there comes a time when sometimes not helping them is helping them because you're teaching them to trust the Lord and stand on their own. Come on, church. So what the pastor is saying, what do you have? Did you notice that? What do you have? He didn't just write a check. Okay, how much do you need? How can I, what can I do for you? If you notice, he asked her a question and he followed up with another question. What can I do to help you? Then she asked her a question. What do you have in your house? Because here's danger, charisma. Listen to me carefully. Self-pity is a crippling emotional disease 
that distorts your perception of reality. Who said that? Eugene Peterson, the author of the Message Bible. When you always feel sorry for yourself, oh, look at me, oh, sad me, oh, I, oh. You're looking at the opportunity that you have. And it distorts your perception of reality. Can I just tell you this? Jesus will meet you as a victim, but he never wants you to stay a victim. Because say somebody say amen. Amen. Yeah, God will meet you as a victim of abuse. God will meet you as a victim of uh, uh, people who left you, of people who did something wrong to you. But he doesn't want you to stay there. Amen. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you so much, he doesn't want you to stay where you are. Amen, somebody. How many of you have noticed this church? When you're following God, you're going somewhere. Come on, somebody. You're going, and your God is doing something. Amen, in your life, you cannot even spell the word God without the word go. God is a God who doesn't want you to be stuck. Let's be straight out. Because a victim mentality exaggerates pain. Because it wants sympathy more than healing. I can tell you a story as a pastor here. Sometimes there's two elderly couple. Came, one elderly couple came, laying hands. So I said, Nai, Thai, what do you need? What I pray for you? Just pray for strength and healing. And uh, pray that... Uh, the government will not pound out that uh, we're divorced already, but we're ex receiving money. How do you pray for people like that? And then after the service, they asked me, can you perform a wedding? Of course, I'm a pastor. They, they asked me, do a wedding, just verbal, no writing, because we don't want to stay divorced. Because they're getting money. They don't want their life to be corrected and be healed. Amen, somebody. When one time I pray, pray, I'm praying. The person asked me, don't pray for my healing, Pastor. I have my lifetime disability. <laughs> Hurts. Victim mentality, exaggerated pain, and one sympathy more than healing. They're sometimes very abusive. Now, this lady was a little bit mad at the prophet. She's just voicing out her pain. But she did never did she not stay there. God opened her eye. Now I want you to see the process how she conquered this, how she became a victor. God, what everybody say, God is for you. Now say that. Type it in. Everybody say, God is for you. Say that to yourself, God is for me. He wants you to have a victory over that pain. Amen. Now here's the person you need to understand. Realize the solution begins with what you do have, not what you don't have. Because our problem is, we always look outside for help when the answer is inside. Can somebody say this with me, Charisma? The miracle is in the house. Amen. The miracle is in the house. I want you to understand this. Two times the prophet asked her, how can I help you? That's very nice, right? How can I pray for you? How can I help you? Then the next question she asked, what do you have in the house? Look at the response of the lady. Everybody say, nothing at all. And then what? How many know it's hard to communicate with the lady? She said nothing except. <laughs> right? You know, it's like you, lady, you go to your closet, look at your clothes. And then you said, I have nothing to wear. No, what you mean, I have nothing new to wear. 
So I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking, maybe the prophet is asking questions because he wants to draw her in to open her eyes. And there's, you have an answer in your house. What do you have? Nothing. That's what the lady said. Probably the prophet said, Really? Think? And then the lady, oh, oh, except uh, a jar of olive oil. She replied, The first thing you need to do is inventory. What do you have? Amen? <laughs> Look at the closet. Look at the garage. Sell some of your wife's clothes. <laughs> Sell some of your husband's sneakers. <laughs> you have something there. Come on, somebody. Because here's the principle I want you to learn, church. When you lost something, it's painful. But what's left is powerful. The lady minimized the solution that she has already. Listen to what the Bible says. Nothing at all except what? A jar of olive oil. I want to speak this over you, church. In the Bible, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. No matter how big or how little, as long as you have the oil, you have God in your heart, you can start again. Come on, somebody. You could begin again. Amen, somebody. I still have a little jar of oil in my hand. How many of you have experienced this? God can do a lot with a little. Amen? What is lost is painful. What's left is powerful. If you lost some marriage, I'm sorry. I cry for you. It's painful. But what is left, you're still alive. You are powerful. You have God in the inside of you. Come on, somebody. You need to understand you are strong in the inside because of God, the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But now here's the process. I want you to please take note of this. You need to trust God to believe what he says. Everybody say faith. You need to trust God to do what he say. Everybody say obey. You know, my friend, my, my God father, I call him hermano. I cannot forget one conversation, conversation I had with him. Been through all the debacles, the trials. The, probably he's like a modern day Job, but he lived now to, he's now in the Job, Job 42 when God restored a blessing and the favor what he lost. But I cannot forget what he said one time. Pastor, the only reason why I'm still alive because of faith. I lose my faith, I die. I believe that, church. As long as you have a little oil and you have faith in the Lord, and you're going to obey what God says, the sky is the limit of what God can do in you and through you and for you. Amen, somebody? So now look at the process of victory. Everybody is together. Then he said, go borrow vessels everywhere, empty jar or neighborhood, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, everybody say, you shall what? Shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour into all those vessels. God wants to take this lady from being an expectator to participator. Because sometimes what we ask is, God, solve my problem. Boom. But God wants you to participate with God. Amen. Amen, somebody. And then God told her, shut the door. Everybody say, shut the door. The principle of closed door is very powerful. In any company, when they're making some big decisions, they have what they call the closed door meeting. Because that will in impact the trajectory of their company. In your marriage, sometimes you have that closed door meeting. Just you your spouse, your significant other. Now, this is a crisis moment. God asked the widow, shut the door. When you get all the empty jars, close the door. 
Because God doesn't want any naysayers. Come on, somebody. Crowds. Because you're believing for a miracle. Can I just ask you, church? Sometimes you just need to shut the door. Everybody says, shut the door. Because sometimes we open our door to news media. We open our door to negativity. We open the door to the devil. We open the door to any. And then your life is so crowded. Not reasoning the Bible. You're not reading the word of God. And it's, your, your life is confused. Sometimes you need to shut the door. Can I add this, church? Sometimes you need to shut your mouth. Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Be careful when you're bitter. Don't say, guard your heart because we might, pff, it will spruce fire. Jesus did this. You know, when Jesus was about to raise Jairus' daughter who's dead, he doesn't want any crowd. Look at this charisma. I want you to do it together. Let's read this together, church. The crowd laughed at him. The naysayers, the haters. Because Jesus said, he's not dead. And they laugh at him. What? Look at her. He's dead. So he made them all live. Get out of the house. And he took the girl's father and mother and three disciples and even the twelve. And where the girl was lying, he held her hand and said to her, Talitakum, which means little girl, get up. I challenge us, church. This is a perfect time, quarantine. When you cannot go to the movie theater, you cannot go there, you cannot go there, you cannot watch uh, NBA or that. This is a perfect time to close the door. Those doors have been closed. Why don't you spend time reading the Bible? Worshiping. Come on, somebody. Building your spirit in the inside. Because when God is about to do something big in the outside, he wants to do something big in the inside first. Come on, somebody. And then, this is the next principle that is hard to do. Everybody say, keep pouring. Look at what the lady did. Everybody, they brought the jars to her, and she what? Everybody say what? Kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. If you are in a people business, in a people industry, the hardest is when you're pouring love, when you're pouring care, you're making those customers number one, you're making those people ahead of your need, and you pour out your life to them, and then one day, Without any warning, they, they just leave you without any text, and they just walk out on your life, and you feel like you've been used, or sometimes you feel like, what? What happened? As a pastor, this is the danger that you might, what you call compassion fatigue, that you get so tired of people's problems. Doctors know this, right? When they're, sometimes they're talking to, sometimes they just want to, okay, okay, here's your prescription. You don't want to listen anymore. What you call that compassion fatigue. Church, I challenge you. Everybody say, keep pouring. Keep pouring, amen? Here's the problem. Human logic says, listen to me carefully. I'm going to drop you a bomb of revelation of sowing seed. Fear says, when I'll pour more, when I get more. That's human logic, right? I will just give if I have extra or left over. If I have one dollar left, I'll keep it to myself. If I have a one ounce of love remaining in me, I'll just love myself, not others. But God says, when you pour more, it becomes more. How many of you believe in this? Our experiences in your life, amen? The multiplication of supply did not happen until the lady started pouring the jar of oil. And then he, wow, oh my gosh, it's still full. Keep pouring. Oh my gosh, there's still a lot. They keep pouring. 
The only time it stops when there's no more empty jars. You know, when during this quarantine, there are some churches, our problem is, how are we going to sustain the church? No offering, no tithes, no service like this, no gathering. Just people depending on they give online or texting. But here, I want you to see this principle. One weekend, I was praying. And I was talking about how to pay this, how to pay that. The church, mortgage here and all this stuff. And a friend reached out to me. Hey, James, would you like to partner with us? We're feeding the world with 10 million meals. We're in America during this time. Convoy of hope to be exact. I pray about it. The Lord gave me a crazy idea. Why don't you do this? All of the tithes and offering that will come for the weekend, don't give it to charisma, give it to Convoy of Hope. So in the natural, you're saying, what about our bills? What about us? Church, the principle is when you pour, it becomes more. So I believe the Lord. I ask our elders blessing about it. I don't make decision in an empty vacuum. I ask them and then, okay, let's do this, Pastor. That's the Lord saying to you. That weekend, I don't know how much money we're going to give, but we promise we're going to give it all. That, that day, Sunday morning, Kuya Homer called me. Never called me on Sunday. So I don't want to bother me because I'm getting ready for church. That's the game day, right? So my Pastor, could you believe this, Pastor? We've been battling with IRS for three years because we overpaid them with their taxes. We received a check of $8,000. Can we give glory to God about that? The moment we decided we sow seed of 5000 to Convoy of Hope, God already talked to IRS, hey, pay this church. How many of you heard a story like that? The IRS is being used by the Lord to pay the church. Come on, somebody. How cool God is. Amen? Because here's the principle, church. Listen to me carefully. God will supply those who are sower. That's why the danger is when you feel you're poor, you're not going to pour anymore. Uh-uh, wrong. Don't do that, church. The blessing comes when you pour. Here's the promise of God. God supplies seed for the sower and will also supply you with all the seed you need and will make it grow and produce a rich harvest for our what? Generosity. So now look what happened to the lady. She went and told Elisha. And the prophet told her, go sell all the oil and pay what you owe. You and your sons can live on what is left. Church, the little jar of oil multiply to pay all her debts and there's even surplus god is not a user he is a blesser but this is where i want you to take she become not just an overcomer everybody say vessel everybody say vessel everybody ask this question what is happening through me now, I want you to read this together. Now, it came to pass when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And she and said to her, this, there is not another vessel. So the oil says, can I tell you this? The problem is not with the supply. The problem is the container. The only time the supply stops when there's no more jar. See that? Give me an illustration. What if you go to Fred Meyer or Safeway? You buy all your groceries, eggs, cornflakes, chicken, everything, the good stuff. While you're paying, you're waiting for the, what you call that, the, ba the bagger, to put it in the bag. You pay your grocery and the cashier said, thank you, sir, you can get all your stuff now. Where's the bag? Where's the bag? Oh, I'm sorry, we don't have any bag. Huh? Imagine you're going to carry those eggs to your car, and then it's dropping, and all those, there's no bag. How many of you are hungry right now? Come on, talk to me, Charisma. How many of you are ready for a pizza right now? Come on, you should have a cheat day at least once a week. Come on, somebody. 
For those of you who don't attend in person, that's what you miss. I'm gonna order right now. Anybody wants Domino, Pizza, Domino or Pizza Hut? Pizza Hut. Okay, Kuya Ed, you're strong to me. I'm gonna call right now Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, here at 188-2036 Avenue West, Linwood. Can I order uh, pizza? Okay. Oh, please, please, don't go on the main door. We're in the middle of the service. We don't want to be interrupted. Can you go at the back door, please? Okay. Thank you. It's coming. Oh, wow. That was so fast. Thank you, man. Oh. Where's the box? You don't use box anymore? They got infected. They got infected. Where... Where did your hand touch? Would you eat a pizza like this? It's all yours, bro. <laughs> What's the point? You cannot appreciate the product. Where's the box? If somebody asks you, who, who wants a hot coffee right now? Okay, here's hot coffee. You want a cup of hot coffee. You need the container, amen. Church, I ask them, how much is this? It's only 30 cents. Hear me out, Charisma. The box, the vessel is us. We're nothing. But when God comes into our life, we carry something. Come on, somebody. God just wants us to be the box. To be a vessel so that His oil could flow in our lives. Come on, somebody. Because here's a principle I want you to see, church. God's operating principle of miracles. The only time, hear me out, God did a miracle without help, without any participation when He created the world. Because God is self-existent. God is self-sufficient. He doesn't err to live. He lives within himself. That's God. The only time he did the miracle is during creation. That's what you call in theology, ex nihilo. Out of nothing. After that, I challenge you, all the miracles God did, it has human participation. Fire from heaven, Elijah had to call it. Rain from heaven, Elijah had to kneel. God will hear our nation, God will hear our land, if my people will come and seek my God's face. Come on, somebody. Feeding of the 5,000, Jesus need the, the lunch from the boy. Now, I want to ask you right now, everyone watching us online, even here, if, if, if this is re resonating to you, I want you to raise your hand. How many of you in this moment, you need Jesus right now? You need God right now. Come on, somebody. You need God right now. Raise your hand. Say amen online. Now I want to ask you again. Raise your hand. Jesus needs you. How come nobody raise your hands? Do you know that Jesus needs you too? Because God cannot do anything without human participation. Or oh, let me rephrase this. Jesus decided to partner with you. You cannot appreciate that pizza without this 30 cents box. You cannot appreciate all the goods that you bought for your family without the bag. God needs a bag. 
God needs a box. And he decided, I need a vessel that I can partner with. It's in the Bible, church. 2 Corinthians 6.1. Would you please read this together? As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's king, kindness and then ignore it. Everybody, 1 Corinthians 3.9. For we work together with... Everybody say, we work together with... Imagine that partner. God says, hey, James, let's work together. Let's do something great in your life. Let's do something great in Linwood. James, hand me your box. Hand me your broken box. So disgusted, broken. Let me feel your life. Here's the thing. Jesus will not do your part. Could you please tell the person next to you? Jesus will not do your part. You know, there's this mom having a hard time raising up babies, maybe two or three babies. You know, imagine how many diapers you have to change every day. So this Christian mom is crying out to God, God, you said you're going to help me. God, you said you're going to help me. I'm having a hard time even changing the diapers of this baby. God, can you do me a favor? Can you change the diapers of my babies? And waiting for a response, God gave her a word. Read Malachi 3.6. Here's what God told the lady. I am the Lord. I change not. God will not do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. Amen? Maybe students, they're praying, God, help me pass the exam. God said, study, review. God, Give me a healthy body. God says, go out and walk. Stop eating that. God, heal my marriage. God says, love your wife as Jesus loved the church. God, bless my finances. When are you stop robbing? Bring your tithes to your storehouse. Bring it to your church. Come on, somebody. Amen, somebody. God will not do your part. And here, don't, get, don't, don't be afraid, church. Our part is natural. God is not asking you to do supernatural things. He's just asking you to do the natural. And he, God does the supernatural. You know, when we watch Hollywood movies, it's spectacular. We feel as if that is the power of Charlton Heston when he was raising the staff. It's like, oh my gosh, look at the biceps. Oh, he's strong. The Red Sea parted. Actually, in the Hebrew, that stuff is just like a stick. It looked like, like this. How many of you could do this? Come on. Do Christ. Do it. Come on. Come on to me. Is that hard? That's your part. David's part, slingshot, who made the giant fall. God, it hit the forehead of Goliath. New Testament time. They will lay hands. Come on, church. Read it together. They will lay hands on the sick and they will what? Check this out, Charisma. Before they recover, what do you need to do? Come on, answer me back. Before they recover, what do you need to do? Church, let me illustrate, illustrate to you how easy it is. Lay hands. You think you could do that? Come on, let's all do this together. Everybody could do that. Just believe. Anoint them with oil. Everybody could do that. Okay, boom, here's for you. Let's you know. God will do the power. God needs a box, a vessel. Especially now in this dark world we're living in right now. You know, I speak today because one of the original members of the church attends at 10 a.m. And when we bought this property from, from the network and she, she was here attending eight years ago, we don't have money because we have a capital campaign. We put all our money buying this property, the down payment. And they will not come and listen to an Asian American shouting pastor. But how do we love this community? God 
gave an idea, like a box. We call that the backpack giveaway. The only money we have is just to buy 50 bags of backpacks. That's all we have. We put it on the altar. We lay hands on each backpack. Then God bless that simple first step. Church, dream big, but don't be afraid to start small. Do not despise small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the Lord began. God is watching you. The first time you give your heart and you're having a hard time, but you let it go. Come on, somebody. God is saying, come on, let's play a game. You give, I give you. You give, I give you. You give, I give you. How many of you are playing that game with God and you found out you can never outgive God? Come on, somebody. You can never outdone God. This generous God. Eight years. Now we've been doing it for eight years now. We don't do this for publicity church. Hear me out. People are saying to me, why don't we buy uh, uh, airtime? And why don't we buy uh, uh, airtime in radio and TV? I always tell people, the money we use for airtime in radio and TV, just buy more groceries and buy more backpacks and give it away. You know, last time we had our 250 mils backpack giveaway, I didn't know Seattle Society is watching us. And they made the right up, and they sent me the right up. Can I just read this to all of you, church? This is from Seattle Society page, Linwood. Linwood, Washington volunteers are staying active in Linwood. A recent grocery giveaway earlier at Charisma Christian Center is evidence of that. Eight years ago, the center's pastor wanted to expand love and care to the community by extending to those who are less fortunate in need of assistance. This mission is behind the idea of the upcoming backpack giveaway. It's a community outreach program designed to help give out backpacks filled with school supplies to help children in grades K to 12 get ready for the school year after seven successful years of being able to give back to the community. We'll help, with help from sponsors like McDonald's, Clothes for Kids, Grocery Outlet, Lions Club, all helping various ways. This annual event been able to have a positive impact in Linwood community for this year's backpack giveaway. We'll be able to hand out 1,000 filled with school supplies as well as 300 grocery, 350 grocery bags filled with essential foods for families in need. Charisma, that's your church! And, that, and then I didn't know that the councilman was here. During the 250 back, they took picture of this. This is, they, say, they said it's Charisma Christian Center, new method of handing out grocery to families. All started 50. Just keep pouring. 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 God can do a lot with your little partner with him. And then what we did for Convoy of Hope, we sow seed to them. Now they're sowing back to us. You know how much inside of that truck is 40,000 40, goods. They even corrected me. Pastor, you're not just going to bless 1,000 families. We're going to bless 2,000 families on August 20. Come on, somebody. Come, in line with grocery. Who could ever thought that? Not me. God. But God needs an empty, clean box. God just wants your emptiness, openness, open heart. And then we could really say this with all our heart, with conviction. We live to give and we love to give. Amen. Second Kings 4, Old Testament, vessel, oil. Second Corinthians 4. I want you to see this, 2 Corinthians, New Testament. Everybody read this together. But we have this treasure. 
in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God in us. Church, you have a treasure inside of you. God lives in an earthen vessel, this body. I was talking about vessel. My wife and I were watching this documentary of a uh, film from Japan. You know, when you broke something, what do you do? Throw it out, dump it, discard it. The Japanese has an art of restoring broken vessels. It became an art. It's called kintsugi. That base is full of cracks. But you know that cracks is made of gold filler. Then it became a masterpiece. Want you to see another base. Want you to see the before and after. And they have specialized this. Your scars are what make you. Or a mosaic art. There's a lot of cracks on those. But when the light shines, it creates a beautiful. You no know, church. I told our God every time you want me to say this, I'll tell it. Hopefully somebody will get inspired with this. Talking about a victim. I'm a man who had been victimized when I was I was molested. I was abused. I was sexually, sexually molested growing up. I did not tell my parents that until I was already 20 something years old because of shame and pain. I have that victim mentality. Oh, I deserve all the bad things that happened in my life because I'm a God, I'm a poor boy, been abused and I've molested, but I need to cope with life. You know how I cope with life? I use dope. At the young age, I've been doing drugs. Basically, I wake up to get me high so I could go up. Then at night, I will make to take downers because my mind is running like wild so I could take us not one hour two hours sleep that was my life people will call my parents hey your son lying on the street take him home he's drunk again he's wasted or he's drunk oh, got overdose again I can tell you stories of a story that I should have been dead by now during those years but I'm standing in front of you and I can tell you somebody met a nobody like me and now God wants to use this body to be God's partner to share the word I am a product of my past but no longer a prisoner of my past amen because of Jesus Christ amen somebody church I just want you to know, you know, God invested in you. you. You guys are in business, right? When you invest something, you take care of your investment. Did you know when Jesus died, He borrowed a tomb. Some of the haters of Jesus, you, know, you see, Jesus was so poor, He couldn't even buy a, a place, a plot in a cemetery. No, Jesus was wise. Why would you buy a tomb when you only needed it for three days? Come on, somebody. When you go on vacation, do you buy a house? Do you buy a, 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 a car? No, you rent a car. You go to an Airbnb, you, a hotel. Church, listen to me carefully. You, listen to me. You, you are not a three-day project with God. He doesn't want to borrow you for three days. He bought you. 
if a master artist from Japan will invest gold on broken vessels, you know how much God invested in you? Just watch this. Read this charisma. You were saved from the useless life. You were bought not with something that ruined like gold or silver. Come on, church. You were bought by the precious blood of Christ. God invested His only Son for you. And He's asking you, I need a box. I want to deliver a message of healing and hope to this dark, dark world. I don't have a voice. Would you be my voice? I need a box. I want you to help those poor people. Help them out. Give them inspiration in life that they can get back up. Would you lend me your hand and give them backpacks on school days? And how we're blessing 2,000 families. I want to end this message on this 4th of July weekend, Independence Day. This one question, how can I partner with Jesus? Maybe the first partnership you need with Jesus is to shut the door of the devil in your thinking. Shut the door of doubts in your heart. Shut the door of feeling a victim that you cannot love again. (laughs) That, That you can never have a family again. That you cannot have a good future again. Church, the reason why I'm crying, that's who I am before. That's how my brain operates. But God did something, renew my mind. And I want to help somebody today and be a vessel of hope to all of us. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. What the enemy has stolen, God will pay you back. He will make it double for all your trouble. He and he will even restore the years that the locusts had eaten in your life. But God needs a partner. Churches participate with Jesus. Lay hands or give, step out. Those are natural things. But I tell you, church, God is watching. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth. He's not looking for people with good credit score or good education or great family names. He's just looking for people whose heart is open. So I will show myself strong on your behalf. On this 4th of July weekend, I want you to stand up on your feet today. I sense the oil is flowing. The oil is moving. We're going to pray the Spirit of the living God to fill our empty jars, to fill our bodies with power, with strength, with hope. Those of you who are watching online, I want you to, to believe with me today. How can I partner with Jesus? Surrender your life. That's all He's asking. Give it your life to Him. Let Him lead you. Let Him guide you. (laughs) I'm not that smart. I'm not that educated. But when I open my life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit fall on me. And I'm saying, come on, James. Game on. See what God can do through you. Amen, somebody. Would you raise your hands toward heaven? Don't mind the time. It's holiday. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. The buffets are still closed. Come on, somebody. Let's have a feast with Jesus right now. Come on, church. Let We are hungry for more of you, God. We are hungry. Lift your hands. God will only fill those who are hungry. God will only don't bless those who are empty. God will only fill those who are open to God. Come on, wave your hand in the air. Hallelujah. Spirit of God. Fall. A 
fresh on us. Change the atmosphere. Change the atmosphere of death. The atmosphere of hopelessness. Fill us with your new hope, oh God. With our hands lifted up, Spirit of God, force fresh on us, cause we need Your presence. Let's bring the kingdom of God to heaven. Your King, rule, come, reign, your heal, deliver, set the captives free in Jesus' name. of God fall fresh on us cause we need your presence your kingdom come your will be done come on, come on shout it out 
and have to now deliver church the spirit of the Lord would you believe God for a miracle in your finances come on dare to believe and obey the Lord yes the spirit of the Lord we need you God a miracle can happen now a miracle can happen now. We believe, Lord. We believe it's gonna happen. Yet the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. With the Spirit of the Lord, and we pray. lifted up in the air just as a sign of a signal to God sometimes you just need to reach out your hand like God pick me up pick me up Lord I'm destitute I'm in debt I'm telling you church God could multiply that little seed that little love that little praise that you still have in your heart. Let's see how God can multiply that. God needs you, church. Believe that with me. At first, I don't want to believe God, me. You needed me. I'm abused. I'm, I'm lonely. I'm sad. I'm suicidal. I've been to drugs. and My education is not that high. Or Me, God, you need me. Then I just opened my heart. And I was just amazed. We have this treasure, Jesus, in earthen vessel, like a 30 cent box, pizza box. It's not about the box, not about the vessel. It's the treasure of God that wants to flow in you. God to say, see what I can do in your life. When you partner with me. God is looking for partners, church. God will not ask you to do the impossible, but God will ask you to do what is possible. Lay hands, give, share, smile, lend a hand, and God will do the supernatural. He'll follow up with the supernatural. God, on this Independence Day weekend, I speak, Lord, an overflowing anointing oil of the Holy Spirit. I speak overflow in our finances in Jesus' name. We are not going down, we're going overflow. Because our source is not another stimulus from the government. Our source is heaven. Our source is Jesus. Our source is El Shaddai. Our source is Jehovah Jireh, the God of plenty, the God Almighty. And God, I pray, here's our box, here's our life. Broken, probably dirty, step upon, abuse. But here's my life, Lord. Fix it, I offer it to you. And make a story of grace <laughs> make a story of healing make a story of redemption make a story of the goodness of the Lord and at the end of the day you get all the glory I'm just a box I'm just a vessel God is my treasure would you please give Jesus a mighty clap of praise today?
Thank <laughs> you.